One thing is certain. If you stick to the word, you will come back with a testimony. What God wants to give you in your life is not a healing. What God wants to give you in your life is not a job. What God wants to give you in your life is not money. What God wants to give you is the word of God in your spirit. It will make you what it talks about. And you are shining. And you are shining by the power of the Holy Ghost. You are shining by the power of the Holy Ghost. You are shining and nothing can stop you. It is your season. It is your time. Nothing can hinder you. This is your time. This is your hour. Favor is yours. We are not on the same level with demons, no matter how high they are. We are seated together with Christ in the heavenly realms. So the more understanding that we have of our place in Christ, the better for us. So it's not as though in dealing with the demons, we are in this deep struggle where we say something and then they also say something. That's not the situation. We give orders. Stay enthused as Pastor Chris continues this expose on spiritual warfare on the importance of meditating on God's word such that you would be able to deal with the forces of life and steadfastly take hold of the authority given to you as a believer. Keep doing what you're doing, walking in love, full of glory, teaching God's word with your heart all on the kingdom of God. Knowing that one of these days very soon, the Son of God will show up and we will be cut away from here. God bless you. Let's look at another occasion here in the Bible. Book of Joshua, chapter 8. We'll read from verse 1. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee and arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai and his people and his city and his land. (laughs) Verse 2. And thou shalt do to Ai and her king as thou didst unto Jericho and her king. Only the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall ye take for a prey unto yourselves. Lay thee an ambush for the city behind it. Okay. Now, let's move on to verse 18. The Lord said unto Joshua, stretch out the spear that is in thy hand toward I, for I will give it into thy hand. He already said, I have given it into your hand. So what is he doing now? He's showing him the strategy. Stretch out the spear that is in thy hand toward I. Toward I. God said to Moses, stretch your hand over the sea. Okay. Stretch out the spear that is in thy hand toward earth, for I will give it into thy hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that he had in his hand toward the city. Next verse. And the ambush arose quickly out of their place, and they ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand, and they entered into the city and took it and hasted and set the city on fire. Hallelujah. Keep reading. And when the men of I looked behind them, they saw and behold, the smoke of the city ascended up to heaven and they had no power to flee this way or that way. And the people that fled to the wilderness turned back upon the pursuers. (laughs) And when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and that the smoke of the city ascended, then they turned again and slew the men of I. And the other issued out of the city against them so that they were in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on that side. And they smote them, so that they let none of them remain or escape. And the king of Ai they took alive, and brought him to Joshua. And it came to pass, when Israel had made an end of slaying all the inhabitants of Ai in the field, in the wilderness, wherein they chased them, and when they were all fallen on the edge of the sword, until they were consumed, that all the Israelites returned unto Ai and smote it with the edge of the sword. And so it was that all that fell that day, both of men and women, 
were 12,000, even all the men of I. Praise God. They killed everyone. And the Bible tells us, Joshua didn't take down his hand until I was completely defeated. His hand was up with the sword throughout till I was completely defeated. Because this time, this was the strategy. Are you there? This was the strategy. Question is, in dealing with spiritual forces, do you realize that you need strategy? You need strategy. Look at that, the next verse, you know, we're reading 25. Look at 26. For Joshua drew not his hand back, wherewith he stretched out the spear, until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of I. God says, stretch your hand over or towards I with your spear. And he kept his hand that way until I was completely defeated. He didn't take down his hand. He had learned from the story of Moses. Hallelujah. Just a few scriptures for us to consider. So, can we bind demons? Obviously. Obviously, to think we can't is to deceive oneself. Scripture is clear that we can. We very much can. For example, if you look at Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 18. Remember when he was... Um, he told us about the, what we should put on, the whole armor of God. Okay? Then he got to this, praying always with all prayer. That means all kinds of prayer. So there are different kinds of prayer. Question is, do they know what type of prayer to pray? And that's why we wrote the book, How to Pray Effectively. How to Pray Effectively. How to pray effectively. And in our prayer life, we, let's remember something. We are not on the same level with demons, no matter how high they are. We are seated together with Christ in the heavenly realms. Okay? We're seated together with Christ in the heavenly realms. So, the more understanding that we have of our place in Christ the better for us. So it's not as though in dealing with, with the demons, we are in this deep struggle where we say something and, and then they also say something. <laughs> and, you know, we keep exchanging words with them. That's not the situation. We give orders. We give orders. We tell them what to clear off. That's why Jesus used the strongest words possible. He said, in Mark chapter 16, verse 17, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out. That means thrust out. It's like, you know what it is to pluck out? You know how to pluck out something? How do you do it? It gives the picture of grabbing somebody by the head and, you know, <laughs> thrust out. He says, in my name, they shall cast out, throw out, thrust out, pluck out devils. Isn't that worse than binding? <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, that's what Jesus said. He gave us the authority to do that. Cast out. And then he didn't give us limits. He didn't say if they are very close to you, you can cast them out. But if they are far away, you can't. He didn't say that. He's given a name that is above every name. That the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow of things in heaven, in earth, and under the earth. So it doesn't matter how high in the heavenlies they are. We speak in the name of Jesus, they have to obey. They have to obey. We don't have to come close enough. The Bible doesn't say we should come close. We give the word wherever they are, they hear and they obey. Even when you start praying from here, 
irrespective of where the trouble is. They hear you. So that's why they are not a factor. Can, can you see why they're not a factor? There was no need for the writers of the New Testament, the epistles particularly, to devote chapters. And that's what some people expected to see, that if this thing were that important, they should have devoted large portions to this. Why would they devote large portions after Jesus told us they've been taken care of? We are seated together with Christ. So Satan and the courts of hell are no, they're not a factor at all. In fact, when you're told that something, that demons are responsible for anything, you should understand that that makes it easier. Because, because they understand authority. Whenever I know that demons are responsible for something, it makes me happier because to me, that makes it easier. I always prefer it when demons are responsible. (laughs) Because that's quick. It's quick response. They understand the message. Sometimes I cast out devils by using my head. I say, "Mm -hmm." (laughs) mm-hmm. They they get the signal. They understand it. It's easier. You know, some people think it's harder, you know, because they say, these demons are responsible. Mm -hmm. These demons, these devils are very wicked. (laughs) <laughs> we are not using our own authority that we got by ourselves. We are using the authority given to us by Jesus Christ himself. And he didn't say if I have faith. No. No. It was not based on any condition. It's by who I am was seated together with Christ. It's by who I am. If there's a devil there, even if I'm feeling sleepy, I say, get out. He will go. It depends on what you think about Jesus. The name of Jesus. Look at it. Let me, let me just give you an idea. You know, my dad was teaching one time, and he said to us, he was trying to explain something about authority. He said, we were in a family gathering. He said, if one of the young ones comes to you to say, Daddy is calling you. He said, even if he was joking and you weren't sure whether or not he was joking, you must answer. He said, because he is not telling you in his own name. He's using Daddy's name. He said, first go and answer. Say, Daddy, are you calling me? Then let me say I am not calling you. See, he's teaching us authority. That's what Jesus taught his disciples. He said, the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore I say unto you, whatever they ask you to do, do it. But don't do what they do. He says, for they say and do not. See, he says the Pharisees, they, he said they don't keep the word, but they represent Moses. They represent the law. So therefore, whatever they tell you to do, do it. Otherwise, you'll be breaking the law. Because they represent Moses. So, but don't act like them because they, don't, they say and they do not. Can you see it? And that was how the Spirit of God taught me about authority. The very first crusade, the miracle crusade where I preached. Because the very first one I organized, my friend, I asked my friend to preach. But the one where I preached... This was how the Lord prepared me for it. Took me to this scripture. The Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore I say unto you, whatever they say unto you to do, do it. But don't do what they do. So he also said, my children, they sit on whose seat? Jesus' seat. Forget about how am I acting? How am I behaving? How am I, how am I... I sit on Jesus' seat. (laughs) Therefore, they have been told that whatever I say to them to do, they must do. Just like Jesus said to the disciples, leave the Pharisees' actions to me, but obey them. Same way the demons understand. That's a spiritual principle. 
So even if they're accusing you, how can you cast me out? You that you don't tell the truth. How can you cast me out? You liar. <laughs> you say, no, I sit in Jesus' seat. I order you to come out. They will leave. Is he supposed to judge us? He said, okay, okay. Let me show you scripture. Zechariah chapter 3. Let's read from verse 1. You'll see something now. Zechariah chapter 3 from verse 1. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. What's he trying to do? He's there to accuse. Okay, next verse. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that had chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. Is not this a, a branch plucked out of the fire? He's there to resist him. And what does the Lord say? Joshua, you see now, if you were doing the right thing, would Satan be here to resist you? Was that what he said? No! He turned to Satan and said, the Lord rebuked you. (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) Say, how can you cast me out? You that you didn't pay your tithe. How can you cast me out? Then some of the brethren there hearing that say, ah, the devil said he couldn't cast him out because he doesn't pay his tithe. What did Jesus say about demons? Demons are with Satan. He said when he speaketh, he speaketh natively as a liar. He cannot tell the truth. Satan doesn't tell the truth. He cannot, he said, it is not in him to tell the truth. He can't tell the truth. He naturally cannot tell the truth. So I hear people casting out devils, and then they say that. So the devil now said that um, it was 14 years ago that he started telling all the story. Stop where Jesus stopped. Where did he stop? What is your name? That is enough. He says, my name is Legion, for we are many. He can go ahead and say, we are 10 of us. And I know that I cast out devils. I know that sometimes they tell lies. They tell you we are three, and I find there are nine. So I only use the one that, what is your name? That's what Jesus asked. He wasn't engaging them. He said, okay, now tell me. You know, some people are casting out devils. They keep the person they're casting out devils for days, consulting with him. (laughs) Consulting with him. Tell me exactly when you came here. Tell me exactly when you came here. (laughs) So they've written that down. Okay, what are the things you have done? What are the things you have done? Then they say, I killed three people, I killed three people, I killed three people, I killed three people. I shot one, I conked one. <laughs> and we're recording what he said, we're writing it down. He said he shot one, he said he conked one. And he died. And you really believe all those tales the devil is telling you? What did Jesus say about him? That he tells lies. Ask him only the question Jesus asked. What is your name? It's enough. And tell him to get out. Tell him to get out. Then he said, I'm the one that has been troubling the church. I'm the one that has been troubling the church. Now we continue to trouble the church. Then you say, okay, okay, okay. So you are the one troubling the church. Yes. Yes. I trouble the church. <laughs> and you start writing it down. Say, so the one that's troubling the church. So, so, how many of you have been troubling the church? There are 10 of us. <laughs> you know, you don't need to get the information from him because he's a deceiver. Most likely, he's deceiving you. Once he's saying, I'm the one trouble, just says, you are living now. You are living now. They say, I, I will go if my other, my team members will follow me. <laughs> say, who are your team members? They are 15. <laughs> Two of them are pastors. <laughs> Now 
that's the way they've caused chaos in certain churches and in certain circles. So now, instead of the gift of discerning of spirits, we are using what? Demonic uh, consultations. <laughs> he's now telling us. He's, he's revealing to us. We believe him. He told me he has 15 people here. I believe him. I really believe him. A devil. <laughs> no, years ago, a man was casting out devils. A man of God casting out devils. Then the devil, after a while of, you know, wrestling, I'm not going, I'm coming out, I'm not going. Then he says, um, Jesus Christ defeated you. He said, no, don't say that again, don't say that again. Then he said it again. The devil said, no, 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 don't say that. Then later on, the devil said, okay, let me just tell you the truth. Let me, det- let me tell you the truth. The truth. <laughs> Can the devil tell him the truth? And you know what? The devil gave him the history. How he fell. And how all these things that, you know, things that we are supposed to be seeing in the Bible. How everything came and how he was defeated, but not completely. You know that man of God actually wrote the story in a book? Satan told him the truth. And use the, 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 the statements of the devil that he was casting out as things to warn God's people on things they should be very careful of. You know, a lot of things that people tell us, they got from the devil. They tell us the things we should be very careful about. Very careful. If you, if you sleep and you, you wake up with something like this, be careful. If you want to sleep, make sure you don't drink too much water. You might dream this kind of dream. Be careful. If you want to have your bath, make sure that you face this side. Be careful. <laughs> so we find ourselves becoming very careful about different things because we don't want demons to come into our lives. Come into our lives. <laughs> demons. <laughs> Wonderful. You have to be very careful. If you find yourself drinking in your dream, then the devil has come into your life. No. Thousand times no. 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 Don't accept those things. We have been placed far above principalities and powers far above them we're far above them we're far above them and you know that if you're studying the scriptures even if you had devils in your life which you opened up to you know a Christian can open himself to a devil oh there are many ways of opening yourself to a devil there are several, several avenues number one is believing a lie. The same way that when you believe truths, God's spirit enters into you through your believing truths. That's the same way Satan enters into a man through his believing lies. You believe lies, you can receive demons come into your life. It's just plain simple. So you accept the word of God and not Satan's confessions. Are you hearing me? So it's important that we stay on God's word and not what the devil tells us. Demons can come into someone's life through fear. Because remember, like begets like. You attract what is in you. If you have faith, you attract the spirit of faith. You attract the things of God. If you have fear, you also attract the spirit of fear. See, you attract the spirit of fear. Fear brings demons into someone's life. So unbelief does, fear does, 
Bitterness does. Anger does. These are all evil things that bring demons into someone's life. I'm talking about even a Christian. Can open a door. How can they go? If you meditate on the scriptures, study the word of God. The same way those devils entered without announcement. They can also leave you without announcement. That's the power of God's word. The power of God's word. When the light comes, the darkness leaves. Because you know, as you receive God's word, faith starts coming to you. And what happens? Fear starts leaving you. As fear leaves, so does the spirit of fear depart. As you study the word of God, the love of God is increased in your life. Hatred, anger, and unbelief, they just go. And as they leave you, so do the demons that follow them also leave. They just leave. That's why it's not every, you know, when we minister to people, even when they're demon-possessed and they don't know God, once we bring the gospel, what does the Bible say? Romans chapter 1 verse 16. Turn to it. If, yeah. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is the power for salvation. So if it will work for non-Christians, how much more easily will it work for Christians? Which means if I preach the gospel to a non-Christian, even if he was demon-possessed, I'm bringing the power of God that brings salvation. Salvation from demons, salvation from sin, and brings him into righteousness. Once he hears this gospel, his heart receives the light of God. Darkness dissipates. The same thing with a Christian who is hearing the word, the word of the gospel. Love is ministered to him. Faith is ministered to him. As he listens, hatred disappears. Fear disappears. Unbelief. He just notices that he's changed. That's why if you keep preaching and teaching the word of God, you will find that you are transforming lives in the church. So even if you are told, that boy, that girl, that brother, that sister, is this or that or that, trust the message that God has given you. It is a weapon. It will produce results. It's a weapon. The gospel is the power of God. The gospel is the power of God. Hallelujah. The next one, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. It says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. Fight the good fight of what? Faith. So no matter what you're going through, you stay what? In faith. And you refuse to go into unbelief. It's a struggle, standing in faith in God's word. No matter the kind of deception that Satan tries to pull against you, but you're standing in God's word. See, so each one of us has that fight of faith. So he says, lay hold on eternal life. Hallelujah. Now, let's, let me show you another thing here that's very important. So you understand that we are not alone and there is a spiritual warfare and angels carry out the things that we say in the name of the Lord. They do. They do. They do. They don't carry out human instructions. But if language means anything, Jesus gave us the power of attorney to use his name. So when I use the name of Jesus, I'm no longer using my human authority. I'm using the authority of Jesus Christ. What I cannot tell an angel to do, in the name of the Lord, he will do. Can you see the difference? Let me show you something. St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. From verse 51. We talked about Elisha that had that army all around him. Look at this. Behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. You remember when Jesus was arrested? Okay, now Peter did this. 
52. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. 53. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? If Jesus could, so can we. He says, don't you think that I can ask my father right now and he will give me 12 legions of angels? Hi! So what were you waiting for all the time you were fleeing and running? I refuse to fear. He says, thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? Next verse. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? Oh. In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you laid no hold on me. <laughs> now he's in charge of the meeting. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Can you see that? Peter's trying to fight for Jesus. And Jesus says, put back your sword. Don't you think I can ask my father now and he'll give me 12 legions of angels? He's trying to remind him about Elijah. Because it was not only Elijah, it was for every one of us. We are protected. And the interesting thing is that Jesus said, don't you think I can request right now? Which means even if we were outnumbered, I can have reinforcement right now. But he's not allowing the angels to do anything. Because the scriptures must be fulfilled. So Jesus lays down his life. said, this one thing I received from my father. He gave me power to lay my life down and power to take it up again. So the angels are there waiting. And he gives no instruction for action. So they stay action. You remember what Elisha did to those guys? <laughs> they were struck with blindness. What do you think their own their own evil angels. What do you think happened to them? They were all arrested. <laughs> Elisha's spiritual angels arrested the angels that came with those soldiers and took them away. And Elisha took these ones away. And they were all blinded. Their eyes were open, but they knew not where they were going. And took them into the heart of the city. When they got there, he opened their eyes. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. That means heaven is with us. Amen. We are not alone. Glory to God. We are not alone. Hallelujah. Mm. Oh, glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Second Samuel. Chapter 24. Let's read from verse 15. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan even to Bathsheba 70,000 men. 70,000 people. That's a whole lot of people. All men. And they died. And when the angel stretched out his hand, it was an angel that was killing them. But on the earth, it was a kind of pestilence and some unknown disease. What kind of trouble is this? There's some epidemic in town, they said. People are just dying. And already reported 70,000 people. And now the sickness is about to go into Jerusalem. Look. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, it is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing place of Arana, the Jebusite. The angel of God is doing this. It's destroying people because of what 
David did when he numbered Israel. The people don't know there's an angel involved. They just see people dying. People are just dying. Next verse. And David spake unto the Lord when he saw the angel. David was a prophet of God. And God opened his eyes and he saw a vision. He saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned and I've done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. And God, God the prophet, came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. See, he's praying to God, doesn't know what to do. He's hoping that God will just change his mind. And the prophet of God comes to him and says, No, it's not like that. There's a way to do this thing. You know? And shows him, gives him instruction what to do. He says, rear an altar and offer sacrifice to God. Okay? So, go to... Let's read 19th verse first. Verse 19. And David, according to the saying of God, went up as the Lord commanded. Verse 25. And Arana looked... And saw, no, no, no. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land, and the plague was stayed from Israel. They only knew there was a plague, but didn't know it was spiritual. But something began to happen in the physical realm. Hallelujah. At the end of time, it's the church that's going to cause the final battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And I want to show you something very interesting about it. Revelation chapter 12. From verse 7. Have you seen it? And there was war in heaven. Now, not in God's heaven. It's like... You say, the heavenlies, okay? Mm -hmm. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. This is, this is going to be the final battle between them. And prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Uh-huh. That's in the heavenlies, okay? And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. They couldn't function in the heavenlies anymore. And I heard a loud voice saying. See they've been defeated. Watch now. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven. Now is come salvation. And strength. And the kingdom of our God. And the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. Which accused them before our God day and night. Hallelujah. And they overcame him. I thought, the, I, thought, I thought the angels were going to say, we overcame. No. The angels didn't think they overcame. They, they, are, they are crediting us with the victory. Because of, because of what we did. You see, we were responsible for the fight. Remember, when Daniel prayed... The angel of God was dispatched from heaven. And then he encountered the prince of Persia. And while he was there, the prince of Israel was sent, Michael the archangel, to fight the prince of Persia. And they released this angel who went, delivered the message and said, I'm going back to the fight. I'm going back to fight the prince of Persia. And after I'm gone, the prince of Grisha shall come. So Grisha will replace Persia. Because we're going to overthrow this devil. But when they do, Satan will reappoint another one. Who caused it? Daniel. Daniel was the reason for all that fight. Daniel quickened the hand of God to cause the prophetic utterance to be established. And this is how the church is going to do it in these last days. He says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. As we use, proclaim the blood 
in our communion, taking the communion, breaking bread. He says, as long, as often as you eat this bread and, and drink this cup, ye show the Lord's death till he comes. And the word of our testimony would bear testimony of Christ as we continue to bear testimony. Not walking in our own self-love. What does the Bible say? That war will take place. And Satan and his angels will be overthrown. And all those evil accusations against us will cease. Amen. And the angels will proclaim they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So just keep doing what you're doing. Walking in love, full of glory. Teaching God's word with your heart on the kingdom of God. Knowing that one of these days very soon, the Son of God will show up and we will be cut away from here. Hallelujah. We'll get out of this world. And so shall we ever be. You know, when we, when we pray, the certain things that we consider as we are led by the Spirit. In the book of Psalm 149, from verse number 5, it says, Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Have you seen that? Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and the two-edged sword in their hand. To execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. Now, remember, there's a law of double reference in prophetic writings or prophetic utterances. You may be looking at this from a physical standpoint in dealing with the heathen. But this is far beyond the heathen. And the writer of the psalm had... uh, physical human enemies in his day. But what he writes goes far beyond physical. It says to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. Next verse. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with feathers of iron. To execute upon them the judgment written. This honor of all his saints. And says, praise ye the Lord. So we need to understand that there is a spiritual side to this. Now, I remember what T.L. Osborne said that was so beautiful. He said years ago when he used to go on crusades, when he would arrive in a new territory, he would say, devil, you must leave because I'm here. He said after a while, he didn't need to say that anymore. He said, now they know me. When I show up, they leave. I thought that was really nice. It's about the recognition of authority. It's about the fact that we actually do grow in authority. It doesn't happen overnight. But as you grow in authority, you would find the experience to really be so. You'll find that it's so. God continues to add more honor onto your life as you obey him, follow him, do the things he tells you to do. He'll give you more honor, more honor, more honor. For example, at a certain stage of your life, you need much faith to get a hundred thousand naira or even a hundred thousand dollars. It's a lot of faith. You might even have to save money to eventually get it. Then there was a time where you needed to save money, make a lot of confession to get one million naira. You were praying, praying, confessing the words that you're going to have a million, you're going to have a million. And finally, both with saving money, confessing the word, you eventually got your one million naira. Even the next two or three times may have been like that as well. Then after a while, your faith went beyond that. 
It became easier for you to have that kind of money. You now started believing for five million. You're daring it. You are taking on a five million naira project. It's all a faith project. You're confessing the word. I have the five million in Jesus' name. We're going to complete this project. Too. You know, you're saying all of that. What is God doing in your life? He's training you. He's lifting you. He's strengthening you. You have gone beyond the 10,000, 15,000, 30,000, 50,000. You went to 100,000, then to 250, 500, 1 million. Now you're in 5 million. Same thing happens with devils and demons of darkness. At a certain time, you find yourself, come out! In the mighty name of Jesus, come out! You're screaming. Then you come out! Maybe the next day they are back again. You notice the same devils you cast out yesterday, they are back. Probably with the same person that was demon-possessed yesterday. You might even feel frustrated. You are back, casting them out. What is your name? The same name you heard yesterday. It's back there. You cast all of them out. You think the guy is free. Next week, the same person is having the same demons again. What is happening? You are learning. You are beginning to discover that there's more to casting out devils than just saying, come out. Jesus said, if a devil, when the devil goes out of a man, he goes to dry places seeking rest and finds none. And he says, I'll go back to the house from where I was cast out. He says, when he comes, he finds it swept, empty, and garnished. Then he goes to take seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and all eight of them come back and possess him, and the man's present state will be worse than his previous state. So you have now understood that it's not enough to cast out devils. You must now replace the devils with angels. You must now replace that wickedness that he had with the love of God. You must now teach him the word. You must now minister the word to him, like the Bible says, that we have been anointed to reassign the world's desolate heritages. So when we cast out devils, we replace them with angels. You see it? But you grow in authority. And if you don't use it, you can't experience it. You can't grow in it. You've got to use it. You've got to use it. Put it to work. When you're saying we're taking over this land, in the name of Jesus, we're taking over this land... Taking over the land, some people misunderstand us. Taking over the land does not mean that everybody in the land will be born again. That's not what it means. Taking over the city does not mean that all the people in the city will come to your church. It doesn't even mean that satanic activities will no longer take place in the city. What it means is that you have the last word in that place. That's what it means. You so grow in authority. Now, whatever you want done will happen. But it grows. It grows. At a certain stage, they may not even know you. But the day will come. Because God, as you honor him, he'll honor you. If you honor him, he'll honor you. He'll expand your territory. He'll expand it. Once he expands your territory spiritually, your territory in the earthly realm will also be expanded. Then you notice that from holding those meetings in the city hall, you are now holding the meetings in the indoor sports hall at the stadium. From holding at the indoor sports hall at the stadium, you finally take over the main bowl. Finally, the main bowl will no longer take you. You are now looking for extra land. Can you see it? What is it doing? It's increasing your authority. Increasing your authority. Increasing your authority. Increasing your authority. Until what you say in the spirit is what happens in the place. Glory to God. Use what you have. Amen. Use what you have. Remember, not only pray here. When you go back, put all these things to work. And say, I'm going to move to the next level now. I want to move to the next level. What is God saying to us? What is our next level? In prayer, he will guide you. You will know. What is our next level? What is our next level in this city? What is our next level? What is our next level? Have you considered that maybe you need a larger 
facility? Have you considered? If you've been having 1,300, 2,000 people, have you considered that it is possible to have 5,000? Have you considered it? Maybe that's the next level. Are you looking for a new facility? Maybe. You must grow a discontent for your present level. Grow a discontent. A discontent for your present level. I want to, I, I, I need to expand. I need to expand. May God will open your eyes to see possibilities. Because do you realize that we can be so used to a certain way of life that we don't see something better? We just continue. We just be used to a certain way. Sometimes you need to be challenged by new ideas, new possibilities. Your, your all nights that you're doing on Fridays. Sometimes I wonder, what are you doing with your, with your opportunities? You're having all night. Or even your Super Sunday, which maybe two churches come together or three or more. Have you considered some larger, larger meetings? Have you considered mega church meetings? You have to have a structure to make it happen. Can you do something bigger? You can ask God to show you a picture. Something bigger, he'll show you. He can show you something bigger. You know, one of the, one of the problems with um, civil servants, they have a dream. Their dream is to have a house, to own, to own a personal house. Once they have built a personal house, they have retired in their mind because they have a personal house. To them, that is it. It's very difficult to get them to do anything else after that. Do you know that sometimes churches are like that? Once they have built a, a facility, that is the end. The way I reason is, is, is not like that. When I'm working on a project... As I'm completing that project, my mind is on something else. I'm thinking of something else. The next level. Because I can't, I can't keep myself at that level. Thinking of the next, the next level. The next big project. What's the next big thing? What's the next big thing? So, if you have a facility that is not allowing you to grow further... You have to talk to it. You say, look, the shoe will not decide, decide the size of my foot. This shoe cannot tell me how large my foot should be. It is your foot that should decide the size of the shoe. Right? But if you allow it the other way, you'll find that you're not moving forward until you are Bored. You become bored. But I refuse to be bored. I'm thinking of advancement all the time. Thinking of the next big thing. See, write it in your heart. What's the next big thing? When you live here, what's going to be the next big thing? Hallelujah. You know, when I was saying to you that, um, I said, you can't bind Satan himself in terms of um, like binding him in chains. I said you can't do that because there's a definite time for that. And that the uh, demon spirits are intelligent beings and they do understand matters of law. So let me show you this from Matthew chapter 8 from verse 27. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gadgesians, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Did you see that? They're charging Jesus. Why are you here? Are you here to torment us before the time? They know there's a definite time for their torment. Well, Jesus didn't come here to torment them, but he will cast them out. Are you following this? So if we start saying, Satan, I torment you 
I torment you with fire. I torment you. It doesn't make sense. Why? Because that's before the time. So that's not going to work. That's before the time. But let me tell you what happens. You say, what happens to those people when you say, um, the fire of the Holy Ghost on you and the devil, and you know, and the person is going like that. Ah, fire, fire. Do you know what's happening to the person? As you're calling fire of Holy Ghost on him, that devil is born in him. It's the man that is feeling the fire. It's not the devil. <laughs> Didn't you read in the Bible how that the demon threw the man down? He threw the man down and tore him. And the man, another one, injuring himself, cutting himself with stones. You think the devil was doing that to himself? No. It's the devil doing it to the man. Inflicting pains on the man. So all that time you're saying fire. Then he puts the heat on the man. Why? Because legally the time of his torment with fire has not come. Are you following that? So we don't need to be saying, you know, I burn you with fire. I, I, I torment you with fire. No. Look at that. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Are thou, hither, are thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them, and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, see, they know they can be cast out. If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep, a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. The whole herd, about 2,000 of them, were destroyed. Praise God. I read that portion of you yesterday, Revelation chapter 20 from verse 1. So we cannot bind Satan and say, I bind you with chains. I cast you into, uh, uh, into the bottomless pit. Well, you can't do that because there's a definite time. And a definite way in which it's going to be done. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit. See, we don't have that key. (laughs) Someone's got to open that bottomless pit. So we can't just cast him in. The pit is shut right now. And there's an angel that has the key. (laughs) Having the key of the bottomless pit. And a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon. That old serpent, which is the devil. And Satan. And bound him a thousand years. Now the Bible does tell us, you can read all the way down to the seventh verse, that after the 1,000 years are ended, Satan will be loosed again from that place to deceive the nations again. Praise the Lord. Until he's finally taken care of. So when you say things, it's good to make sure that whatever you're saying measures up with the word of God. Otherwise, it will be meaningless. It will not work. So don't just go, I bind you. What does binding mean to you? What exactly are you saying? So you look through those things that we have said, the meanings of those words, the scriptures, and um, you find that it is pretty easy. Can we bind devils? Yes. But we must be clear on what it means. Praise God. With the Lord. Amen. Open your mouth and worship Him and pray. The message that you have just heard is a production of the Love World Media Ministry. For this and other messages by Pastor Chris, visit our Christ Embassy bookstores. Or better still, log on to our website at ChristEmbassyOnlineStore.org. And that's just a click away. God bless you.